Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm just going to start the program with a poem and uh, through commentary and poetry, um, I'll be able to share my experiences and my notes on citizenship. Arrival. At Roberts Field Airport in 75, before the three of us boarded that swollen monster with wings, Junior, a dried eyed buffoon in girl's shoes, a noisy pair of Mary Janes stumbled away from me and Dunway as we wailed and clung to Grandma and Sully. There were things we didn't heed. He tasted the hot dog even before the pan am roared. He forgot all about cassava and boonie fish gravy and he stuffed the limp pink meat between his sore cornered mouth, grinned like a fat rodent and played with the stewardess's red hair. He didn't squash his face into the porthole, imprinting Monrovia on his mind. He didn't throw a grief-filled wave at his short pant playmates. Bento boy stood patiently for my brother's goodbye, like country wives waiting for husbands who never return. He brushed past our parents at JFK airport, halting their drowning embrace, his eyes only chasing the finery and shine. My brother has always been searching for those things he was promised long before our parents sent for us, when we were forced to eat the scraps, when we were swaddled in poverty and we would mend ourselves with tales of America, America. There is gold in the streets. Everyone is fat with wealth. You can be John Wayne cowboy, but you mustn't carry Liberia with you. So I wanna tell you good morning again, and I wanna tell you thank you for having me, and I'm appreciative um, to the Philadelphia His um, Ethical Society for providing a platform for different voices and different experiences. My presentation will be part poems and part commentary. Um, and these will be my poetic notes on citizenship. So the poem that I just read, um, it's entitled Arrival. And it reflects on my own immigrant experience coming to America um, from Liberia as a young child with my two siblings in 1975. And they are part of a manuscript in progress. Although most of some of my poems are not autobiographical, this one and several others are part of this manuscript. And the working title for the manuscript is Citizen Several Times Removed. And it is an attempt to trace the immigrant experience through poems. Um, but beyond that, it bumps up against other things that impact the immigrant experience, uh, trauma and issues of belonging and not belonging, displacement and isolation. And they're just as integral to the immigrant experience as discovery and opportunity. Most people relate more to the opportunity and the discovery end of things. And only now are we hearing a lot more about how all of these intertwine and there's also um, the balance of it. You know, there's the other side. My hope is to provide a balance um, or as the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie Ngozi states or warns against in her TED talk, the dangers of a single story I do not wanna present a single story from a single lens. This is not just a poverty story or struggling immigrant story, um, but it is the full picture with all of the beauty and grace and the fears and the heartache and all of which makes up the person that appears before you today. And so before proceeding again, I, I do wanna share another quote by another artist. It's a visual artist this time. And you may be familiar with the artist uh, Kihinde Wiley. Um, who among other great accomplishments, he's widely known for his 2018 portrait uh, commission of former President Barack Obama. And the quote that he uses related to a project um, that he has called Black Rock. And in 2019, uh, Mr. Wiley created this brand new residency in Dhaka, Senegal. And he intended it to be in an in a oasis, as he says, a place for uh, artists on the African diaspora to create and he used the quote 
To be able to create an identity under duress is the defining feature of an African aesthetic, even an African-American aesthetic. So to be able to create an identity under duress is the defining feature of an African aesthetic, even an African-American aesthetic. So this idea of citizenship is complicated and is stressful, and it's even more daunting when it eludes you for years and you have to chase it. And once you finally achieve it, you find that because whether you are Black or African or woman or all three, uh, it is an ongoing fight for your right just to exist. So you manage the reality that at any time, all of what you've come to know as this life can be upended, whether it's through policies or politics, prejudice, systemic injustices, all of the isms that exist. An invitation to travel. In North Philly, we were ambushed by a rogue visitor, one that clutched our throats and threatened to choke us out of this budding Americana. That March, someone reported us to immigration and after an investigation, we were sent a decision. Arriving in a letter, neat and succinct was our invitation to travel. The Mason family is ordered to depart from the United States of America at your own expense on or before April 2nd, 1979. And we were guilty of the worst crime. We had no papers, dirty immigrants, huddled masses, illegal aliens, pretending to be Americans, hiding in plain sight among the good people of Philadelphia. A frenzy lot of Liberians we were, not even living high off the fat of the land. We didn't even sip the milk or the honey, a shrinking life we had, so hushed in fact. That night, I strained to hear my father's cry, my mother's whimpers barely audible, and even I learned to tuck this voice under my tongue and didn't release it for years. So that poem was called An Invitation to Travel and is one in that collection I was speaking about. So a little bit more about me. A few years ago, I requested and received most of uh, hundreds of pages of my family's immigration and deportation record from the late 1970s through the late 1990s. And I was able to do this through the Freedom of Information Act, which also uh, allows individuals to request access to federal agency records or information um, specific, you know, uh, that uh, except to the extent that the records were protected from disclosure. And some of my family's records couldn't be disclosed because it listed immigration and official names and specific details about how we were reported to immigration and had to endure over 16 years of court appearances back and forth, stays of dis uh, deportations and uncertainty as we sought to become legal American citizens. So my mother and father came to America from Liberia, West Africa in 1971 and 1972 respectively. So it's a little different. My mother, our immigrant story is a little, a, a tiny bit different because my mother came first. She's the one that came and she came to Washington DC and she settled there and she cleaned, you know, hotel rooms for about two years or so until she was able to send for my father. Um, and she sent for my father and he came over and they made a life very briefly in Washington DC. And then from there, they came on to uh, Philadelphia. And in 1975, we arrived. I arrived with my brother who is now deceased um, and my sister. And then we, my parents had another sibling here in America uh, when we came also in 1975. So we came on student visas and it was for the usual reasons, for better opportunity, for schooling, jobs, et cetera. And Liberia is and is very much still a country of haves and have nots. And we were in the have nots category. Um, so despite its beauty, it can be a difficult place to live without access to basic things. So our visas eventually expired and what ensued was years of living undocumented as illegal aliens, which was what the term is known. Eventually we were reported as undocumented and we don't know how, sort of a family mystery of how this happened. 
Some speculate it was a jealous relative or a neighbor. Others speculate it was my mother's employer. She used to clean houses for a woman in Rosemont and um, she had gotten another job and there was some discord. So it could have been that, we're not certain. So with that, my father was arrested and the family unit was shaken and forever changed as we tried to fight to maintain our new lives. So I was eight and, uh, and when we came to America and this was about 12, I was 12 when all of this happened. And I didn't become a citizen um, in the legal term until I was in my late twenties. And so many other things happened between you know, that time. My mother got sick. She eventually went back to Liberia, um, lots of upending. So reading through the records brought back a lot of feelings, even as the documents felt cold and clinical. The records represented a significant period in my life and the lives of my family members, but they didn't convey that there were real people behind these stories. Our experiences didn't have a voice. It told a familiar story, but it was one-sided. It's basically stated these people illegally were, are lived in this country. It didn't tell our side. And I imagine that these are some of the same feelings that present day undocumented immigrants endure or feel on this quest for uh, citizenship or the right to belong or to count yourself in that number. Um, so I started working on a series of poems that use these documents as a foundation to tell stories about immigration, deportation and placemaking. I wanted to create poems that honor and illuminate the immigrant experience, specifically from a West African perspective or an African perspective. And we're more than the headlines and the stereotypes and the harsh policies. So the language, the tone, the imagery, et cetera, reflect. I wanted them to reflect the lived experiences of a person who is uniquely African American. But my intent uh, in these poems that they would be universal and that they would tell a wider story. I also wanted to tell those funny stories too, you know, um, because as I talked about at the onset of this, it's not just about the doom and the gloom um, because in everyone's lived experience and everyone's experience, even of uh, extreme trauma, um, there are aspects of it where one um, has, I, I always say, um, flashes of beauty, moments of beauty, um, and so I, I want to tell those funny stories, like how my cousin was so devastated uh, when he came to America and he looked around him coming out of the airport and he saw all of these trees without leaves and he was just heartbroken. And he believed that there were no leaves in America and then that there were these just bare trees. But he didn't, he came in winter. <laughs> so he come at the end of, um, you know, almost at the end of winter and spring had not come yet. And it was magical for him because there are no, you know, four seasons in Liberia. We have rainy season, uh, you have the dry season, but you don't have the falling leaves, this beautiful autumn that we are experiencing now. And I also want to tell those love stories, like how my cousin was so desperate to get citizenship in America in the 80s that he proposed to this woman in the supermarket. And I don't know, after two or three days, uh, <laughs> they ended up agreeing to something and they ended up getting married and um, they were married for 30 years and they were very much in love. Uh, so there's an interesting stories on the surface. We're seeing, oh, he's trying to get his green card. So he's going to marry anybody. And he accosted this poor woman in the market and walked her to the car with his groceries. And they ended up getting married, having children, having a family. And I also want to tell those inventive stories as well. I uh, like making do uh, with the limited ingredients uh, to make some semblance of our home meals in the early years. We wanted to make those things we enjoy like potato greens and cassava leaf and palm butter. And I remember living in Philadelphia, there may have been three to maybe, no, I would say maybe one to two stores where we could get some ingredient that wasn't totally authentic, but we were able to create some semblance of home meals in the early years um, before there were more access to the imported goods that we have now. We knew that we were missing something in that pot, in that meal, but we were missing home too much to admit it. 
So we had to just make sense of that and it, we were being inventive. Now to this idea of belonging and not belonging, of displacement, uh, that is all part of it too. I have always either lived in North Philadelphia or Germantown, except for a brief stint in college where I lived in West Philly for one year. And I considered myself a citizen of my community, a community that is rapidly being eaten up with the haves, you know, or the have nots, a community um, that's up for land grab and gentrification, all threatening to upend this notion of home. And where does one actually belong? If one lacks resources, is there a choice in your belonging? Like us moving to North Philadelphia um, was really an economic decision and was also a decision at the time because there were small clusters of other Liberian immigrants. Um, so if one lacks resources, is there a choice in that belonging? Is there really a choice where you land um, in this quest for citizenship? So America in 1975 and America of today have many things in common. Back then, I knew what it felt like to be disregarded and disrespected. I, I kind of knew about prejudice, but I couldn't name it. I was a child. Um, today, it is glaring and it's things. I also know that a community, I also know what a community is capable of. A community can stand together despite efforts to break some of its members down. Citizenship is also about seeking community, knowing community, despite the efforts to upend. So there's a poem that I have called We're All Trees Here. And I wrote this poem. It's called We're All Trees Here, poem for those who find themselves in a new place. And I wrote this poem at the time when um, we had the last election and there was a lot of emphasis on immigration and who belongs and who didn't belong. And it's something that I really wanted to call attention to um, through my poem. poems. We are all trees here. They are talking about us, mother. It's us they're talking about, father. Us three sapo trees, one bent with a third leg, a walking stick to steady, another gaunt with gout and an eyelid that droops, and me who has swallowed this entire country and now know its hypocrisy. We are the enemies. That's what their placards say. We watch it on television. The fat face, red, the, the, the fat red face ones, the stringing hair ones, the ones in suits and pulpits, in schools and offices, with badges and gavels, the ones we feed and clean for, the ones we bathe and toil for, the ones with violent pens, the ones with sawn lips. The placards do not discern. An army of accusers have knighted a new leader. He is a bloated finger pointer. He has carved an eye on our foreheads. I for in my country, you will never be safe. I for ignoring that I have snatched this land from others. I for I have invaded and ravaged your homeland and I won't let you rest in this one. I for immigrant and all of us are lumped as one and all of us are trees in this woodland. And every day, somewhere in this place, somewhere someone is brandishing an ax. There is someone chipping at our base. There is someone wanting to topple us. So I close with the fact that this idea of citizenship is complex, but as Kihinde Wali alludes to, the fact that even after duress, we're still able to create, to thrive, to forge ahead is amazing. So my plea is to know that belonging is something we create for ourselves with our community of supporters. Belonging is a place we arrive at after a turbulent and beautiful journey. It is a place that has to be reimagined and reframed. So I wanna share, um, it's a poem that will, uh, my last one that would just shed a little light on, it would dovetail a little from the beginning, I talked about our arrival. And then I'm gonna talk about just trying to make meaning out of you know, what 
um, this experience means. And for me, the meaning that's made is through poetry, um, through, through writing. Um, this is how it makes sense of this idea of citizenship. Letter to my sister. I have turned our childhood into a few dozen verses. There are place for dramatic pause. There are places for dramatic pause. And where memory failed, I embellished a bit. You've grown impatient with me and my so-called poetic license. I don't remember that has become your wary mantra. D, I am learning to excavate the good times too. Can't you see where I've colored some words and inserted those tender moments? A famous writer once said that eventually I will tire of myself and be compelled to tell the eyeless stories. I anxiously await that moment. But for now, I want to tell them about our war with mama's illness and how at school we remained for being foreign. Remember, Dee, when they chased us up Tioga Street and accused us of having voodoo and scanned our dark bodies for tribal scars and discovered the cayenne pepper we had hidden to throw in their faces, to sting them, to make them fear us, to be left alone, to be African. D, I have managed to poem all my pain. Tell me, what do you do with yours? Thank you. <laughs>